Luke's Gospel and chapter 12. Luke and chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verse 29 down to verse 31. Luke chapter 12 from verse 29 to verse 31. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do you remember Theophilus? If you've been with us from the beginning, or if you know Luke's Gospel, you might remember that this is the man to whom Luke is writing. This lover of God, this lover of the truth, this believer who needs to be confirmed in the things in which he's been instructed. <clears throat> he needs to get to grips with the truth as it is in Jesus and its consequences. And Luke is writing then to and perhaps for a man who may well have funded some of his research or helped to support the wider gospel work. Theophilus then is a person who may well have to take account of some of the particular things that Luke has been teaching us about the Lord Jesus Christ and the ministry of the word and the works that he did with regard not to laying up treasures for ourselves but rather proving rich toward God. Our Lord Jesus has been emphasising here constantly the importance of right priorities, that richness toward God, that investment in the kingdom, the soul over the body, heaven over earth and eternity over time. Now we have learned not to neglect the body or earth or time because this is the sphere in which we do now serve God and show our allegiance to Christ. But it is with a view to the ultimate importance of soul and heaven and eternity so that we do not prioritise time over the eternal state. The true and living God must come first in the life of every disciple. And what these disciples on the road needed to learn, Theophilus too needs to learn. And what Theophilus needed to learn, you and I need also to learn. That life consists in more than having stuff. That life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. That life properly considered consists in knowing and serving God. This, said our Lord in John's Gospel, chapter 17, this is eternal life that we might know God himself. And that is something that cannot be calculated in terms of what you've got in your wardrobe, how much food you've got in your cupboard, how many snacks you've got in your bag, or how much money you've got in your bank account. One of our challenges as we seek to live like this, and perhaps a challenge for Theophilus too, in a world that may have been increasingly dangerous for a true Christian, and one in which uh, owning Christ as one's Lord and Saviour may have been increasingly costly, is that the body and earth and time are pressing and insistent. The things of this world tend to crowd in upon our vision. They command or demand our attention. And when that happens, the response is typically worry and anxiety and fear. And that's what our Lord is contending against here. He's encouraging warning, reminding his disciples, either because those things have started to take root or before they even take seed in their hearts, do not worry, do not have an anxious mind and do not be fearful. Because when worry and anxiety and fear get into our souls, then those original priorities get yet more twisted. The world becomes important to us, worry, anxiety and fear set in and so the world becomes even more important to us and we end up being sucked down into this 
uh, attitude where we're, we're taken up entirely with the things that we can see and feel and touch and taste. And we forget that there is this substantial, unseen reality. The, the world that we know by faith. And to counter that kind of downward spiral, our Lord gives us these three pressing negatives. Do not worry, do not have an anxious mind, and do not fear, little flock. He's already told the disciples not to worry. And he's drawn their attention to the ravens of the air and the lilies of the field. And he's emphasised the care that God, as God, has taken of his creation. Even these unclean birds have everything that they require. And those lilies of the field, they outshine Solomon for splendour, though they are the, the creatures of an hour. And we're to learn lessons from them against the temptation to little faith, to that niggling spirit of unbelief that does not think that God will take care of those who have followed him. Christ wants his disciples to know that food and clothing for pilgrimage and service will be supplied by the God of heaven and earth. And now here is another aspect of that same issue, another angle on this same concern. Do not seek what you should eat. And we should remind ourselves, it's and do not seek. Yes, don't worry. But and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, there's a, an overarching command here that is not to have an anxious mind. And we'll come on to the importance of what you seek and not seek because that shows what anxiety looks like in this world. But the, what I think is the overarching command here in that sequence, not worrying, not anxious, not fearful, is this command, do not have an anxious mind. Have you ever had somebody say to you, or perhaps you've said it yourself, I've been left hanging. I just don't know what's coming next. I'm, I'm in suspense. You've left me without any solid foundation and I don't know where to turn. That's the language that's being used here. Do not have an anxious mind. Don't live in this state where you're hovering between fears. It's a state of insecurity and instability, a kind of a rolling pattern of anxiety. Now I checked with a couple of people and apparently uh, not many of those that I know about have actually been on a ship in fairly rough seas. But perhaps you have been and perhaps you know what it is like when uh, a ship uh, perhaps a larger vessel or maybe it's a smaller boat, especially perhaps when the bigger ship is turning across the seas or when it's a smaller vessel that is uh, going across the waves. There are those horrible lurching moments when either there's that roll and drop or you're, you're left feeling like you're hanging in midair and then the ship lurches down, the boat rocks into the next trough and you're lifted again and there's that roll and slap and your stomach constantly feels about a second or two behind where your body is. And it's a most unsettling feeling. It's a part of what makes us, uh, particularly under those circumstances, feel seasick. It's the queasiness, the, the nausea of someone who's lurching about and being constantly rocked from one agitation to another. And that's the kind of thing that the Lord Christ has in mind here. That's the kind of life that too often we can live. Just rolling from one wave to the next, lifted up and then dropped down again. Left hanging in a constant state of suspension and apprehension. Always anticipating or looking at yet another problem so that our life becomes a perpetual question of what's going to happen to me next. That's what it means to have an anxious mind. 
this constant series of agitations and concerns that roll in upon us and leave us constantly lurching around, unstable and insecure. It is a very common frame of mind. Most of us know something of what it is like, perhaps even in particular seasons of life, to feel like we're being buffeted by one wave of misfortune, as we might say, after another, though we do not believe in misfortune. But the, the tendency to load tomorrow's problems onto today is a part of this. It's one of the things that Matthew picks up when he's recording our Lord's words, perhaps on this or a similar occasion. It's bringing forward tomorrow's troubles. Yes, I'm, I'm having this today, but that's coming tomorrow. And then next week, I, I've got to do that. And then the week after, this might happen. And what if that were to take place? And what if this were to occur? And what if I don't get that sorted out? That's the anxious mind, the, the perpetual what-ifs of fearfulness and doubt and concern. And you and I need to ask ourselves, does this describe me? Is this how I tend to live? Is this perhaps how I'm living now? Do I recognise myself in this description? Perhaps constitutionally, it's just the way I am, I might say, or circumstantially, it's what's happening to me right now. But are you living off balance in this constant state of agitation and apprehension? Always worrying about the what if, always suspended off the latest fear and wondering what you're going to drop into next. Are you constantly off kilter, agitated about what's always coming? Do you know what the Lord Jesus says to you? It's not the most subtle command. It is this. Stop it. That might not sound like the deepest psychology. It might not sound like the most sensitive spiritual physician. But it is essentially what the Lord Jesus Christ says. He says, don't be like that. Stop having that anxious mind. Stop indulging that attitude. Stop cultivating that littleness of faith that leaves you in this condition. And you might say, well, that sounds a little bit cold, a little bit harsh. Uh, perhaps going, like going to a doctor and you say, well, you know, doctor, I've, I've got this problem. And the doctor says, well, stop doing that. It may be that perhaps uh, somebody is, is grossly overweight and they go to the doctor and they say, you know, doctor, I've got this terrible problem. I keep putting on weight. Well, how much do you eat? Well, about five times the amount that a normal person needs to. Well, stop doing that and you will get a little better. That will help you. And you might say, well, it seems a little bit black and white. It seems a little bit cutting, a little bit absolute. And while Christ means to stop us in our tracks... While Christ means to tell us that it is not right to have that kind of attitude, there is also real compassion and tenderness here. It's here in these words. It's here in the reminders that we have a heavenly father. It's here in that sweet language. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so when Christ tells you, do not have an anxious mind... He is going to illustrate the issues that have to do with it. And he's going to communicate comforts to you. He's going to provide you with what you need to understand where that anxiety comes from and how to deal with it. So here is this overarching concern. Do not have an anxious mind. Don't live in this state of agitation and apprehension. And now we come on then to Christ's underlying concern. Where does this anxiety show itself? How is it demonstrated? And Christ is saying that it is revealed fundamentally by what you seek. Notice how it all fits together. Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. 
For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. So now it is this seeking that comes to the fore. And this is, this is how we show what our hearts are set upon. And this is what either causes us to be anxious or that causes us to be at peace. So what does Christ mean when he says, seek this but don't seek that? What is this seeking? It's when you set your heart on something. It's what your will is turned towards. It's the rigorous pursuit of something. Are we close enough yet, for Chris, yet to Christmas for you to know what you really want? Perhaps if you're younger, that will make a little bit more sense, although I suspect that most of us who are older might have some idea as well. We've got our heart set on something. It's often the language we use, isn't it? Oh, that's what they really... Oh, that kid, they've got their heart set on this thing. It's, it's all their waking thoughts. Perhaps if you're uh, saving up for a gift... Perhaps you're saving money for something. This is what I want. I am, you might say, seeking that thing. It's, it's a continuous search. You ever get those huge tubs of chocolate Christmas time or about this time of year? And it's, you know, it's got all the, uh, the different flavours in it. And apparently there's this uh, survey that's been done and people are up in arms because... Quality Street have got it wrong. You know, people, people like the wrong kinds of chocolates. You know the one that you like. It's the one that you go looking for. It's always the one that someone else has been there before and they've got them all for it. But you know, you'll go digging down to the bottom because that's the one that you want. You're seeking your favourite chocolate. Whether it's the caramel keg or the nut triangle or whatever they may be. I think I'm getting some of those right. But you're seeking them. You've got your heart set on something. It's what you search for. It's what you go digging for. It's what your mind turns toward. And Christ is talking about having that kind of attitude toward the most basic things, food and drink. In one sense, we're even closer to the necessities of life than we were last time. Then it was food and clothing. Now it's food and drink. And in this climate, drink is even more important than food. There's a, there's a rule of threes, you may know it. You can last for three minutes without air, you can last for three days without water, you can last for three weeks without food. You've got three days if you don't have food and drink before you will succumb. These then are the basic necessities. And remember Christ begins with these because as he's already said with regard to the uh, the worry and the ravens, if you're not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? So let's talk about the most basic things. What do you get agitated about? What are you apprehensive about at the most basic level? Belt and braces, nuts and bolts, food and drink. How are you going to keep yourself alive? This then is the seeking that reveals the fundamental direction of your heart. It's what really bothers you. It's what you're reaching out towards. It's what you're continually searching for. And it shows your spiritual attachments, ultimately. What your heart is set on tells us what your heart is like. As Christ says in verse 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what do you seek? What does your heart go after what is it set upon and what's striking here in terms of the seeking is that Christ is now emphasizing the fact that his disciples are not like other people they are distinct they are set apart from the rest of the world by their priorities by the things that they seek after they are governed by different desires to those who do not know God and his Christ. They have different goals. They have different appetites. And although it may not come out very clearly in our English translations, in the original, five times, Christ emphatically is saying, now you, 
as opposed to others. You as opposed to others. You as opposed to others. He's speaking to his disciples. He's looking them, as it were, right in the eye. He's got his hands on their shoulders and he's saying, now remember what kind of people you're supposed to be. Remember whose you are and who you are. And it's always been that way. Remember, if you go all the way back into the Old Testament, when God first called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, or Abraham as he was then, and he said, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And God gave them those laws over time that set them apart as a holy people who had a distinct relation to the true and living God that meant that they did not think and live and act in precisely the same way as the other nations of the world. They had different priorities, different desires, and different goals. So then, what do the nations of the world seek after? They seek, as a general description, all these things. What are all these things? Food and drink, and all that kind of stuff. That's the concentration if not the obsession of the nations of the world. It's what attracts them. It's what they seek after. It's what they've got their heart set upon. And by using this phrase, Christ is again being quite upfront with you. It is essentially pagan to live with this level of concentration on the stuff of this life. This is what godless people live like. They never lift their eyes above the things of this world. Remember that life is more than food. But those who do not know God do not know that. They have no sense of life being any more than keeping this existence going. Keeping life here ticking over. They cannot speak the way that Christ speaks of the relationship between the child of God and the heavenly father. They do not know God as their saving Father. Even though they enjoy some of the same mercies as the ravens and the lilies, even though God sends the sun to shine and the rain to fall upon the just and upon the unjust, they have no notion of God as one who knows them and loves them and cares for them. They don't understand providential care. That's why they become anxious. They are constantly lurching from one situation to the next. To them it is a stream of misfortunes. And they have their terrible years. And 2020 is just the fuel for a thousand memes to describe that life this year has been absolutely rotten. It's been aimless. It's been pointless. It's been devastating. Everything's going wrong. No one knows what's taking place. We're being battered and bruised. Life is the absolute pits. What is there to live for? How can a Christian think like that? That's the attitude and the expectation of a world that does not know God. No wonder people are anxious if they have no true and saving knowledge of the God of all the earth. They're just chasing what's in this world before life expires, before their final breath finishes everything off. Is Christ saying... Abandon life in this world. Is Christ saying, don't care a thing about what happens in this world? No, he's not. He says elsewhere through his servant Paul, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, then you ought to aspire to live a quiet life and to work hard, because if a man doesn't work, he's not going to eat. Or in Ephesians in chapter 4, there he, uh, he exhorts people, Paul, speaking on behalf of Christ, exhorts the Ephesians that those who have stolen in the past should steal no longer but work with their hands so that they might not only support themselves by implication but have something to give to others who are in need. So Christ is not against legitimate effort. He's not against the, the principle of cause and effect. Hard work tends to produce a good reward. But he's reminding us 
But that in itself is not what life is about. We're not to be like the hamster on the wheel. Work hard, get more. Work hard, get more. Work hard, get more. And the more I've got, the harder I need to work in order to maintain the lifestyle to which I've become accustomed. Have you ever seen the hamster on the wheel? Horrible existence, isn't it? <laughs> Always running, never getting anywhere. But isn't that the way so many live today? This desperate sprint. Always reaching out for something. Running as if there's something wonderful to be attained. But never actually getting to anything worthwhile. What are you reaching towards? It's not wrong to take account of life in this world, as we shall clearly see. But it's not the be-all and end-all. It's not about what I can accumulate here. It's pagan. It's unbelieving to live as if food and drink and all those kinds of things are the most important thing and all that really matters. So here's now the contrast. All these things the nations of the world seek after. But what about the people of God? And here's that you, 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 you. You're not like that. Here's a specific instruction that is given. Here's a, a distinct outlook. Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things, but you seek the kingdom of God. So you don't seek food and drink and all such things, but you seek the kingdom of God. You are not to live in a state of apprehension and agitation about things like food and drink. You are not to live as if the body is nothing more than food, of life rather is nothing more than food and the body no more than clothing. You are not to live as if mere existence and ideally a comfortable and pleasant and easy existence is the be-all and end-all of life. You are not to have that fundamentally pagan attitude. Again, you remember how the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 tells God's people there in Rome, and they would have been so subject to this disposition, this way of thinking, that you're not to be conformed to this world. That you're not to think like unbelievers think. But you are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And these are the sorts of things that the apostle has in mind. You're to look up. You're to look higher. You're to see not just with the eyes of flesh but with the eyes of faith. You are not to be constantly concerned about the things of this life, but you are to seek the kingdom of God. That's what you're to set your heart on. That's what you're to be all about. That's what you're to be reaching out towards. That's what you're to be searching for diligently. That's what you're going to always be reaching after. You are to concentrate on and constantly to pursue the glory of God and of his reign. If you go back to chapter 11 again and verse 21, not verse 21, chapter 11. I'm not sure where I'm meant to be going there. Don't worry about that one. Um, but you're to concentrate and pursue on the glory of God and his reign. It is the rule of God in your heart and the rule of God in the hearts of others. You are to be taken up with the fact that here you are a follower of and a representative of God. You are to live like a citizen of heaven while you are here upon earth. Now, do you remember how the Apostle Paul describes that in Philippians and chapter 3? There he's talking about the fact that we are no longer citizens here. We are to follow his example and note those who so walk as we have them for a pattern. For many walk, and listen again to the contrast between these two dispositions. Many walk, 
Many go through this life, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Listen to the description. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship, again the contrast, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Again, you hear the contrast, you hear the emphasis. You are to seek the kingdom of God. You are not to be like those who set their mind on earthly things. What a penetrating description of those who are always worried about food and drink. Their God is their belly. They are devoted to the things that are passing away. The disciples, on the other hand, are to live like eternity matters most. Why? Because it actually does and their decisions and their actions are to reveal that attitude in their hearts. Again, remember Colossians and chapter 3, the same exhortation from the Apostle Paul. If then you were raised with Christ, that's these disciples. They are now alive through faith in Christ Jesus. If that's the case, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind... Seek after those things above, not on things on the earth, because you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You see the same disposition, the same attitude, the same reminders, the same contrasts. You're not to be taken up with the things with which the world is taken up. You're not to be pursuing after those things. When you do that, you'll be lurching from trouble to trouble and you'll never be at peace. No, you're to reach toward those things which are above where Christ Jesus is. And here then is the revelation of your heart. Here is, on one level, the answer to the question, are you or are you not a Christian? What do you seek? What do you want? What are you living for? What are you running for? What are you reaching after? Perhaps even what do you pray for? If we could overhear one another's prayers, would they be these grubby little requests? God, give me more of this. Or would they be heavenly in their scope? You boys and girls who are at school, some of you perhaps shortly taking important exams, you're working towards your GCSEs, you're thinking about your A-levels, you're concerned about your degree, you're thinking about the first job, you're worried about career prog progression, you're asking, where will the next post come from? What's my advancement? What does this look like? And perhaps you, you go to those career advisors, and how do they calculate? Well, we think you could be earning this much. We think you could get your foot in the door in this kind of company. When they're calculating, not all of them, but most of them, they're thinking primarily in terms of worldly success. That's how you measure whether or not you're getting ahead of the game. Have you bought into that mindset? Is it all about food and drink and all those kinds of things? What have you set your mind on? What are you seeking after? What have you set your heart upon? To what do you devote your time? To what do you give your energy? Where do you invest or spend your money? How do you react to times of blessing? Do you pat yourself on your back and try and climb higher up the ladder? How do you respond to times of adversity? Do you shake your fist at the heavens? Or perhaps curse God who's given you these things? In terms of your priorities, do you recognise that which is enduring but not yet seen over that which is passing 
and seems to press in upon the senses. A Christian lives for the eternal kingdom. And that's why we need to hear the command of Jesus Christ. Do not have an anxious mind. The Christian lives for a lasting treasure and has learned what we learned in chapter 9 and verses 24 and 25, that the greatest tragedy that can befall any person is that they would gain the whole world and lose their soul, remembering that no one ever truly gained the whole world. A Christian then knows and follows in the footsteps of a saving Christ. A Christian understands that there is a cross now and then a crown. A Christian understands that though there may be suffering here, there is glory to come. A Christian appreciates that it is better to suffer now with Christ and then to reign with him above than it is to have all that the world offers here and then to spend eternity in the pit of hell. Again, I know I've used this illustration before. Some of you remember it from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress when Christian goes to the house of the interpreter and he sees those two little boys playing in a room, passion and patience. And passion wants everything now. He gathers up all his stuff and he goes at it hammer and tongs and it all falls apart. He demands, demands, demands. I want it now. I want it now. I want to play my games now. I want my toys immediately. And then there is patience. And patience sits with a calm smile upon his face because patience is content to wait for his good things. And the picture is just so plain as Bunyan is just so pointed. Here are the nations of the world. Passion. I want my toys and my pleasures now. But I do not think that they must all be broken and lost. And then I will be left with nothing. And here is the Christian. Patience. Not seeking after food and drink and all these things. But seeking the kingdom of God. Is that it? Is that as good as it gets? No, there are also encompassing comforts. Remember that though Christ speaks straight, he also knows how to buoy up our souls. Again, read through. Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. That's fairly straightforward, no question there. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, you are not to be like them. Now notice. And your father... Your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, plain, clear, absolute, and all these things shall be added to you. Again, there are tender compassions here. Christ knows that there will be challenges and difficulties for those who are going to follow him. And he doesn't say, look, just suck it up and get used to it. Just get on with life and learn that it's going to be nasty, brutish, miserable and short. No, he says, as you live like this, as you turn your back on that kind of crushing and crippling anxiety, as you let go of your striving for the things that belong only to this world, I want you to remember whose you are and who you are. Here are comforts for Christians. Here is compassion for the people of God. Here is a sweet reminder and an encouragement for those who give the kingdom of God its proper place and prominence and priority. Here is a, an assurance for those who do not lay up treasures for themselves but are rich toward God. Here's an encouragement for the disciples on the road. Here's the encouragement and the exhortation to Theophilus as he reads and calculates what it's going to mean for him to be a follower of this Jesus. And here's the comfort and encouragement for me and you as we ask, what does that mean for us then in this world? Remember this, says Christ. First of all, your father knows 
that you need these things. Your father, who's he? Oh yes, the God of heaven and earth. The God who made all things, who gives to all life and breath and all these things. That God is your father. And again, you can go back to chapter 11 from verse 1. It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, start like this. Our Father in heaven. And that is such a sweet relation. It's the foundation of the comfort that we enjoy as we make our way through this world. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day, each day that we need it, that day's bread. And forgive us our sins. And then the verse that for some reason I couldn't find a few minutes ago, chapter 11 and verse 11, I think I was looking in the wrong chapter. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, what are fathers like? In the nicest possible sense, they're soft touches. God-like fathers are easy to be entreated. They've got an open heart and an open hand. They love to good, give good gifts to their children. And your own father, he knows what you need. The relationship emphasizes the closeness, the intimacy, the affection that binds us together. Your father knows that you need these things. Not that you want certain things. He's not going to indulge your perhaps extravagant appetites or your expectation for abundance. He's not necessarily going to give you tomorrow's bread today. But day by day, he knows what you need. And there will be a sufficiency in accordance with his generosity. You can rest on your father's compassionate concern and affectionate knowledge. Your father knows that you need all these things. A few days ago, I hope she won't mind me using this illustration. My daughter forgot her lunchbox on the way to school. Everything was ready. We just left it lying on the side when we went out of the door. We were driving in the car on this occasion, trying to get to school in time. And she said, Daddy, I've forgotten my lunchbox. And for a while, she didn't quite get round to saying, can you make sure I've got some food at school today? But eventually, she suggested that that might not be a bad thing. And could I not have said, don't you think that your father knows that you need these things? Yeah, sometimes there's a lesson to be learned if you've been a bit careless. You, know, you, you may not be able to have precisely what you wanted when you wanted it. But we're not going to make you go through a whole day without food and drink. Your father knows. And dad's going to make sure that before lunchtime comes, you've got food and drink for the day. Now, does your heavenly father know what you need? Perfect knowledge, perfect compassion, perfect love. Your father knows that you need such things as these in the world, food and drink and stuff like that. And then when you seek the kingdom of God, all these things all that kind of stuff that you need will be added to you. What things? The necessities, food and drink, the stuff that the world spends all its time reaching after. God is going to give you that as the added extras. You'll have the kingdom. Do not fear. It's your father's good pleasure to give you that. But with that kingdom, he's going to give you all these things. Their basics are your bonus. What they're living for are your added 
extras. Only let the glory of God be your concern. Only let the good of souls, yours and others, be your first regard. And God will throw all that stuff in alongside his kingdom. It's staggering, isn't it? People live their entire lives, devote all their time and their energy, invest everything they get in getting more. And God says, if you need that, I'll do that. I can provide that for you as much as you need, when you need it. You leave that with me, I'll take care of that, but you, you seek my kingdom. You give yourself to my glory. You live for my honour. You seek the eternal blessings of your soul in me and for my name's sake. And I will give you everything else. You don't have to desperately grasp after it because I am going to graciously give it to you. And my friends, the proof of that, as we'll come to God willing if the Lord spares us, is seen in what we do with what God gives us. How do you know whether or not you actually believe that your father knows what you need and is willing to give it to you? When you sell what you have and give alms, providing yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Now, is that the behaviour of somebody who's seeking after food and drink and all that kind of stuff? No, not at all. It's someone who holds these things with a light grip, ready to offer them to God for his honour and glory. Who can say this? Who can live with these comforts? Who can call God Abba? Father, those who are trusting in Jesus Christ. Those who know this God as their God through his Son. Those who have let go willingly, cheerfully, even eagerly of the things that once caught up their minds and their hearts, that captured their affections and have set their minds on things above where Christ is. Because Christ died and rose again and we have died and our lives are now hidden with him in God. Does that then describe you? Because these are not just everybody's comforts. The nations of the world don't know God as a father and don't have this distinct, affectionate, compassionate care. But God's people do. Why then are some of you still living for this passing present? When you know about the eternal future. Why are so many of us still attached to and attracted towards the stuff of this life? Living as if food and drink and those kinds of things were the be all and end all. Living as if life is no more than food and the body no more than clothing. Calculating everything in terms of the next exam grade or the next paycheck or the next career advancement. Thinking only in terms of present security. Thinking like the man in the parable, I know I'll get more stuff. And when I get more stuff, I'm going to stash it. I'm going to store it up for myself and I'm going to say to myself, soul, you have many good things for many long years to come. Now kick back and enjoy yourself. No, that man was laying up treasures for himself. Christians resting in God can be rich toward God. Why then would you spend this life grasping after the world only to lose your own soul? Why would you not lay hold upon Christ and follow him And let go of the burden of agitation that comes with living for this passing life. And trust your Father in heaven who knows exactly what you need. And with the kingdom will give you all these things. Let me close with question and answer one from 
one of the old catechisms of the Reformation. It's called the Heidelberg Catechism. The first question is foundational. It's fantastic. It sets the scene for everything that follows. Question one. What is your only comfort in life and in death? What is your only comfort in life and in death? And already you know that the nations of the world aren't going to answer that question like the people of God. This is how a child of God answers that question. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and redeemed me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my Father in heaven not a hair can fall from my head. Yes, that all things must work together for my salvation. Wherefore, by his Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. What are they trying to capture when they write those words? They're trying to capture the spirit of one who has grasped what Christ says here. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you.